Good morning. I'm Susan Gribus, a volunteer at the Spencertown Academy Arts Center. We are having our Festival of Books, and I'd like to welcome you. I will be introducing our story and reader for the Children's Festival of Books program today. Thank you for joining us. We have a wonderful program this year. And as you can see, we are online doing our festival virtually, not in our big tent behind our historic building. So let's begin. Our story today is Nikki and Vera by Peter Cease. It's a story honoring a man, Nikki Winton, who saved hundreds of children from the Nazis as remembered through the eyes of one of the children he saved. Her name was Vera. This is a tale of action and courage. The author of this story, Peter Cease, is a Czech born American illustrator and writer of many children's books. He has won many awards for both his writing and illustrating such as the Caldecott and the Hans Christian Andersen Award. That's one of the highest recognitions for writing and illustrating of children's books. And our reader today is Ann Gaynor, a friend to the Academy as well as children's librarian teacher and children's literature aficionado. Anne is currently the storyteller at both the Altamont and New Lebanon libraries. Not long ago, Anne was also the librarian at the Mary E. Dardis Elementary School in Chatham, New York. Anne lives in Altamont with her husband, Stephen, and they make frequent trips to Rochester to visit their wonderful granddaughter, Talia who loves stories. So just a few reminders as we begin today. To see the whole page of the book, if you take a look at your screen and you want, you want to make the pages of the book fill your screen. So you should look for uh, speaker view or full screen uh, under view in the right hand corner perhaps. Uh, it might be somewhere else on your screen. So give that a try. And if you have questions or something you'd like to ask about, write it down along the way or raise your hand when Ann asks for questions or comments. Lastly, we ask that everyone mute yourself during the story. The mute button is on the lower left of your screen. Let's do that now. You muted yourself. <laughs> I muted myself. Uh, good morning, Susan. Uh, and now it's time for Anne to read Nikki and Vera by Peter Cease. Enjoy. Thank you, Susan, for that introduction. I'm very happy to be here at the book festival and particularly happy, happy to be reading this book. Nikki and Vera, a quiet hero of the Holocaust and the children he saved. I wanted to point out, this is the title page that already Peter sees is giving us an idea of the, where this story is taking place. This little island here is England, and this fuzzy little country here is Czechoslovakia. And the red line is the train ride that we'll learn about in this book from Czechoslovakia to England. Okay. Nikki was born in 1909 into a century full of promise. And if you look at the circle around Nikki, you can see that Peter Cease has given us some images of things that made the 20th century quite unique. 
uh, and that it, there were all these inventions that happened. The car, the telephone, the airplane, electric bulb, the radio, all these had a huge impact on people's lives. At Nikki's school, the children were encouraged to follow their interests, whatever they were. Nikki discovered he liked mathematics, stamp collecting, photography, and fencing. The students had all kinds of pets. Nikki raised pigeons. And you can see that the author has put Nikki on a very, very large pigeon in the illustration. And he's also wearing a very fancy fencing suit. He's got the helmet on, which is important. And also he's got a sword in his hand, which is the most important part of fencing. In French, it's called an épée. And all around in, a, in the oval, kind of sidewalk, you can see children who are walking with their favorite, presumably favorite animals. It didn't matter what the students were interested in, so long as they were interested in something. As a young man, Nicky traveled all over Europe. He worked as a banker. He learned French and German, how to ride a motorcycle, drive a car, and fly a plane. He was an expert fencer on an Olympic team. And you can see in the four corners here, there are circles with pictures of fencers in different positions. That was important to him. Nikki and his friends talked about politics. They worried about the situation in Europe. In Germany, the Nazi party led by Adolf Hitler was building an army. Now on these pages, you can see how the author has made Germany which is in the sort of middle, quite dark, darker than the rest of the page. And there's a big circle with a man holding his arm off. That's Adolf Hitler. And then the illustration starts to become colorful and that's giving us a clue that we're entering the part uh, about Vera. And you can see her in a circle above a map of Czechoslovakia, which isn't identified, but there is a little place where it says Prague, and that will be important. That was the capital. In December, 1938, Nikki planned to take a skiing vacation, but a friend called, come to Prague, he said. In 1938, Vera was 10 years old. She lived with her family in a small town near the big city of Prague. And you can see that he's indicated that this is a small town by making all the houses connect in a circle. And in the middle of the circle, if you look closely, you can see a little queen and behind her, are marching three cats. Vera was the queen of cats. She would adopt a stray whenever she found one. She loved to feed the horses that pulled the wagon for her parents' business. And you can see that in the lower right-hand corner, right beside a picture of her father. And you can see her up in the second floor of her home feeding cats and more cats are coming up the ladder to the, from the first floor. And on that side is also a picture of her mother. It was a happy childhood. Vera's family and their neighbors were proud citizens of the young Republic of Czechoslovakia. They were one of the few Jewish families in town. It made no difference. They were all friends. Vera helped her almost blind grandmother when she came to visit. Vera's grandmother remembered Vera's face by touching it. And you can see in this picture on the left, 
Vera and her grandmother and all the cats upstairs. Sometimes when the family visited cousins in Prague, they went to synagogue. So Prague was the big capital city. And when they would go there, and that's represented by the circle in the upper right, there's lots of buildings, but then there's one that's pink. And that is the synagogue, which is a place where Jewish people worship and pray together. You can see the family walking to the synagogue. Vera's family spoke Czech, which is a language like English. But if her parents wanted to share secrets, they spoke German to each other. And down on the bottom of the picture, you can see uh, Vera's parents, and they are saying words, nine and ya, ja, which are not English. Nine means no, and ya ja means yes in German. So they knew two languages. Maybe your parents know another language they speak and keep secrets with. In October, the German army marched into the border region of Czechoslovakia called Sudetenland. People afraid of the Germans ran with everything they could take. One morning, there was a new girl in Vera's class. Vera gave her an extra pair of shoes. You can see her in the upper left there. I had no time to take anything, the barefoot girl said to her. In the family cellar and barn, there were suddenly extra food and clothing. And there's Vera's house. All the cats are up in the attic, squished together, and her mom is saving things, putting away food and clothes. When visiting Prague, Vera's mother heard about an Englishman who was helping children leave Czechoslovakia to escape the Germans. She discussed it with Vera's father and they decided that Vera should go to England. Now, if you look at the picture once again, at the upper left, you can see the beginning of big crowds of people. And this is representing all the people that were leaving the Sudetenland where the Germans had occupied the territory and coming into Prague. And this in the middle of the Prague picture, which has a lot of gray buildings, you can see a square. And that is where Nikki eventually got to work in Prague. And those of you who are Jewish may note that in the family picture with Vera and her family, they are celebrating maybe Hanukkah or maybe just um, the Sabbath. It's a festive meal. The Englishman was Nikki. I'm sorry. He saw that war was near and something had to be done. England would allow refugees under the age of 17 to come only if families could be found to take care of them and travel could be arranged. So here you see Nikki. He hoped he was going skiing, but he didn't. Instead, there were all these very serious events happening in Europe around that time and they are signified in big circles on the four corners of the page. This is Nuremberg, and it's presumably a picture of thousands and thousands of people in each of these rectangles, and Hitler up on his big stage outdoors giving a speech, showing that he had the, back, he had the backing of many German citizens. Here is a picture that is actually two things. It's a map of Germany drawn to show us Hitler's face. You always know it's him because of his mustache. And then the lower part of the map is the country of Austria, which Hitler had already annexed. He had already made it part of Germany. On the right is a picture of the Munich Agreement where lead Hitler met with some other leaders in Europe trying to work out uh, a peace. But eventually that was not to be. And you can see in the right-hand corner, 
the beginnings of the kind of activities that Hitler um, was going to ask his soldiers to commit. This was something called Kristallnacht, which means in German, night of the broken glass. And the soldiers went into communities where there were Jewish people living and looted and broke into their shops, beat the Jewish people, and also burned any synagogues that they came across. So it was a horrible thing. And these were all on Nikki's mind. He set up an office in a hotel in Prague. He made lists of children. He took their photographs. He found trained connections. Spies kept watch. Now here you see Nikki up in the second floor there where he had his office. And on the street are the lines and lines of people waiting to get their children a place on his trains. In the windows, you can see shadowy figures of spies. I think you skipped a page. Can we go? Thank you. In January, Nikki returned to London. In the evenings after work, he placed advertisements in the newspapers to find foster families to take care of the children. He applied for visas, which are kind of like passports, and made travel arrangements. Sometimes he paid with his own money and made his own stamps. Now stamps, they're talking about like the stamps that maybe the post office uses and some libraries still use. And they were to show that the documents were true and from the government. He would make up his own and they were able to pass. There wasn't much time. And on the left, you can see him making arrangements with various people, some, a train guy, and presumably talking to some families about taking in children. But you can also see in the bottom picture, the man on the left and the woman on the right are listening. So you have to be very careful at that time because you never know who was paying attention to what you were saying or doing. You have to be very cautious. In March, 1939, the German army invaded the rest of Czechoslovakia. And this is how they came, in trucks full of soldiers and with tanks. And it was very frightening. Line after line of German soldiers marched through Vera's hometown. You can see these little blobs here. These are representing all the soldiers that came into the town. And now they're coming in to Vera's house. Here's some of the soldiers. One of these soldiers came to the family house and said that he would be moving in. He told them to stop speaking Czech. Vera's father refused and Vera vowed that she would never speak German. The day came for Vera to leave. She packed her clothes. Vera's father gave her a diary. He told her to write down her memories until she could return home and see them again. She said goodbye to her cousins who were to follow her to England on a later train. She said goodbye to her grandparents, which you can see her saying goodbye in the upper right-hand corner. And in the bottom left is her father giving her the diary. And at the bottom right is the train station. Seventy-six children got on the train. Vera tried not to cry. She and the other children did not know what lay ahead. So they told stories about the lives they were leaving behind. And on the left-hand side of the page are pictures that show that at the top, families walking to the station with their children. 
then all the adults looking at the train inside the station, which you can see is very large, high ceiling. And then a picture of the adults looking in at the window of the train. And finally, the children who are seated inside the train. And you can see each of them has a little circle around their neck. That was a tag that they all wore to identify who they were. And all the grown-ups looking in through the windows. Now here's a page without any words. But you can see there's a long snaky train and it starts on the right hand side and you can see the little circle that is Czechoslovakia, Prague, and then the train snakes and snakes and snakes around and snakes over to the next page until finally it lands in London, where you can see London Bridge and the Tower of London. And the one train car that is in color and we see the inside of is where Vera was. The thing that is quite magical, I think, about this page is that the train is on a picture of the sky and you can see the night sky and you can see many stars and Peter Seas has created fanciful constellations as he imagined the children might do. You know, you can look up at the stars and see Orion's belt and Cassiopeia, things like that. Well, he created his own and, and pic pictures of things the children might have been thinking of like their mother giving them a cup of soup, a grandfather like an old mushroom, a rabbit, see if you can find that, a big fish, a cat, a goat, actually there are several cats, and on the far right is the moon. After three days and nights, they arrived in London. The rest of the children were picked up. Vera waited in the empty hall. Finally, her new family came. And you can see on the back of Vera, all the things she was probably thinking about from her home. When she arrived. Eight trains left Prague in the spring and summer of 1939. You can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 669 children of all ages reached London safely, including Vera. You can see her on near the bottom in the colorful car. On September 1st, Germany attacked Poland. That day, the ninth train, carrying 250 more children, including Vera's cousin, was due to leave Prague, but the borders were closed and the train never left. You can see the attacking German army. They came to Poland in airplanes and dropped bombs on the country, as well as the tanks and the soldiers. Nicky was out of time. The war had begun. He put away his records in a box. He put on a uniform, you can see. He served in the war as an ambulance driver. He was evacuated by boat from the French city of Dunkirk as the German army advanced. You can see an ambulance. And then you see on the other side of the print, someone who is holding a big spotlight up and looking at the planes. And these were used sometimes to, to hunt for planes. And then there's a, a light coming down from one of the airplanes shining on the ambulance. Vera wrote in her diary every day. She learned a new language, 
She went to a new school and learned to eat new foods. The war was everywhere. She had no news from home. She hoped her parents were safe. When the war was over, Vera went back to her town. Her family was gone. Her father and mother had died in the Nazi camps. Her cousins too. She only found the daughter of one of her old cats. She did not stay in Czechoslovakia. And I think it's kind of interesting. The city of Prague in the upper right corner is now being symbolized by what looked like gravestones because of how many people had died. You can also see that Vera is not a small girl anymore. Five years have passed and she is a teenager. After four years, she returned to England. She got married and had a family. I just wanted to point out to you that this is a picture of London and I know that because uh, two very symbolic things of London are red double-decker buses on the left and red telephone boxes which we don't see very much anymore because everyone has a cell phone. But in those times, and when I was growing up, if you wanted to make a phone call and you didn't, weren't near home or somebody you knew, you would look for a public telephone and they would sometimes in cities be in these boxes, which were like tiny little rooms. You go in them, they had a door, you shut them, there was a phone, you put money in and you could make a telephone call. Nikki lived quietly. He helped open a school. He got married. He founded an old people's home. He never told anyone about the children. So he still has his epe, his sword. But if you have a chance to look at the, this book, which I encourage you to do, there are illustrations everywhere on his body. And then on the left side of the page, which shows some of the things that he did in his life as an adult after the war. When Nikki was an old man, his wife found the records up, up, up in the attic of their house. And there she is finding these papers that identified children. One day he got a phone call did he want to meet some people he used to know? Vera got a phone call too. Did she want to meet some old friends? And here are pictures of lots of different people, but who are they? Nikki was a guest on a television show. On the left is a camera, and then you follow the white light, and there's Nikki. He didn't know it. But the old friends he had been invited to meet were some of the children. Vera was one of them. She sat next to Nikki. When the host told her story, she stood up. Everyone in the audience stood up. Why? Because every one of the people in the audience was an adult who had been a child many years ago on the trains that took them out of Czechoslovakia to England and saved their lives. And Peter Cease shows us this very interestingly in that if you look at each of the adults, inside them is a little brown child representing them as children. Six hundred and sixty nine children would not have survived if not for Nikki, who went to Prague and saved their lives. I was not a hero, Nikki said. I did not face any danger as real heroes do. I only saw what needed to be done. And the last 
next to last picture shows Vera and Nikki. And between them is a tree that is in, its branches are in the shape of a heart and then inside are many, 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 many hearts. And you can think about what that may represent. There is a lot more information in this book, as you can see here, the author's notes. And again, if you're interested in the story, I encourage you to get it and read it because it's quite uh, illuminating. But then, whoops, one more page, if we could see the last page of the book, boop, 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 the picture, the double spread. Do you not have it? It's not that big, the next one, not this one. Ah, thank you. At the end of the book, with after the historical part there, there's this beautiful picture with which Peter sees ends the book. And again, you see the heart tree. And if you look, you can see that there's a heart all around it as well. This is England. The water is the English Channel. There are many, 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 many people on the shore of the land at the other side, which would be Europe. And you're able to know that because of these little icons he puts in it. Besides the land, on the left is a windmill, which would be um, Holland or the Netherlands. And then we have the Eiffel Tower in the middle and the Leaning Tower of Pisa over on the right representing Italy. And that is the end of the story, which I hope you enjoyed and maybe learned something from. Um, we now have time for questions and we have a pretty small audience, so that will make it cozier. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about why this book is so special to me. My mother was a teenager living in Poland when World War War II started. Like Vera, her family was forced to house a German soldier. Unlike Vera, my mother was not able to escape. She endured living in a ghetto and then imprisonment in several Nazi work and concentration camps, including Auschwitz. Like Vera, she went home at the end of the war and found that most of her family had perished. And she too left her home country of Poland to live first in Sweden and then in the United States for most of her life. Lucky for me. This is one of the reasons Nikki and Vera is such a powerful and special story to me. It has been an honor to read it to you. And now, I'm happy to take any questions that I can hopefully answer. Does anyone have any questions about the story? If you do. Unmute yourselves, everyone. That would be a good. Yeah. You can unmute. If you um, unmute or... yourself, then you can ask a question. But maybe you don't have any questions. Some of us know some people in England and maybe in conversation after this program today, you can ask them if they've heard of the trains and the rescue of the children that went on. Um, I think I know one of our participants has um, some family in England and they may remember this story and remember this having happened uh, when they were very young. Um, uh, it is a true story. And um, I just think it's his illustrations are so uh, much like a movie. They bring you in and you're just looking at all the details and symbols and the way he's telling you so many things without words. Um, uh, as an artist, I really appreciated uh, looking at his illustrations. Anyone else comment? I was wondering, since we're mostly adults here, <laughs> um, 
I hope you may have had a chance to read the converse, uh, to listen to the conversation of Peter Cease with uh, somebody from the Academy. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's really interesting. And in that conversation, he talks, he's asked about artists who may have, um, let's see what I'm looking for. Influenced? In, influenced, and yes, thank you, Susan. And I'm wondering if any of you, in looking at the illustrations, I realize it was your first time, but if you had any ideas about who those artists might be. When, yeah, I didn't hear a word or two. Who inspired him? Yes. Inspired what, 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 influenced I, him for for the illustrations in the book. Right. Artist. I, I saw one uh, little reference to Chagall. Yeah. The two I parents uh, kind of flying in the air. Yes. And there were quite a few, actually, if you go back and look in the book, especially that constellation. one. There was another one. Did anybody else? notice and i just learned this because of the having listened to his uh interview uh clay the swiss painter yeah. and if you know any of Paul his clay. works Paul right. clay. yeah yeah uh i had a question why do you think the german officer commanded vera's father to speak german only Yeah, Lola, you're you're muted, honey. Yeah. Um, so maybe uh, they don't like um, talk about them badly, or so they could understand them more. Yep. I. That's what I was thinking. No secrets. Yeah, Karen. I was interested that they didn't speak Yiddish at home. Huh. I know that's a <laughs> one of your fortes. Uh, you know, perhaps they did, and he just decided, obviously, this is a book for children, you know, there's a ton of information, and maybe perhaps he decided to leave that out. That might be a um, something to look into. Perhaps you could contact the author and ask. <laughs> I don't know that all Jewish families spoke Yiddish. So, and this is Czechoslovakia, so it would be an interesting question. It is interesting. If I could add, um, yeah. in Hungary, in Hungary, it was the same thing. Um, most of the Jews, or many of the Jews, were very secularized, and they were they considered themselves, as he said in the beginning of the book, yeah. uh, they considered themselves Czechs in Czechoslovak in Czechoslovakia. They considered themselves Hungarians, and they spoke Hungarian. They spoke Czech. So I think that's why it was not. Um, as as um, religious oriented and speaking Yiddish as in uh, Poland and parts of Germany. Yep. Oh, here's something I learned. <laughs> Do you know where Czechoslovakia is, you know, generally on a map of Europe? Right. I mean, do you think you could point it out? And then, did you know that it is no longer one country, much to the chagrin of most of the people who live there? But anyway, it was divided up into two, one called Slovakia and one called the Czech Republic. Hmm. I did not know that. Yeah, I didn't either. But as I said, apparent, most of the people who live in Czechoslovakia are very unhappy about that. It was a govern, a, you know, political decision. Okay, well, if nobody has any other questions, I'm gonna, oh, Lola. Does the author like write any other like books on the same subject or? On the same subject? Yeah. No, but he has written a lot of really interesting biographies, of people who he says were heroes to him. And one of the things you learn reading about him. Ah, okay. And so this is one that's kind of autobiographical. It's called The Wall. And it's about the wall that Germany built between East Germany and West Germany. 
after the war and how it affected people. Yes, and that's by him. Yep. yep. Growing up behind the Iron Curtain, that's what the, the wall was called at that time. And he's, so he's also written these other biographies of um, Galileo and I believe Leonardo da Vinci mm -hmm. and uh, I can't remember who else, but they're all in Tibet style. Tibet. Art. Tibet. Tibet. He wrote a story about Tibet because he himself has gone there and met the Dalai Lama. Right. So, and, and he's also, he wrote a couple of several children's books, children children's books. These are really a really great example, I think, of picture books that are not for, that we typically think of as children's books for young children in school. These are substantial pieces of literature with beautiful art um, that helps you to understand it. But he did make a board book about a fire truck because his, when his son was little, that's what he was interested in. It's a little unusual in terms of the artwork in it. And then a series of stories about his daughter, Madeline, who her like family name, they called her Madelenka. And I think there are two Madelenka stories. And that was when they were living in New York City mm -hmm. about her life there. But he is quite an interesting person. He also won a MacArthur grant mm -hmm. at one point. Those grants that they call the genius grants. He also pointed out in his, one of his interviews that in a lot of the pictures, illustrations, you will see very faintly um, a, a labyrinth um, image that's stamped. Sometimes it's a circle, sometimes it's um, a square. Oops, sorry. And um, he kind of describes his life as a labyrinth um, and that there is, you just keep turning and going through one way and oh, that's not the right way to the next door. Okay, this way. And that you never know how you'll get to the end point, but you just keep going. And um, he was, it was interesting to see how he um, described his life's journey. Um, that way uh, and how he incorporates personal things throughout the book as well. Um, uh, thought that was kind of interesting about him. Mm -hmm. Oh, and before I forget, if any of you are interested in this Nikki story, there's a wonderful, very heartrending video of that TV program that's in the book. And you can find that on YouTube. Mm -hmm. It's not very long and it's, very moving. Yep. Many people know about that. It was going around kind of virally for a while. Right, right. Um, and there are other um, bibliographical references in the back of the book itself. Right. I hope that some of you might, you know, either buy it or get it out from your local library because yep. it's worth a second look. Nikki and Vera. Yeah, that's what it looks like. And I'd like to thank those of you who did get up on Sunday morning and find your way to your computer and watch this. If you want to share with anybody, uh, again, I was told that the, mm -hmm. this reading as well as the interview will be on YouTube so they can be accessed by people after today. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Very much. Thank you, Anne. Very much. Sunday. Thank you. Thank all of you for joining us today. Um, and as Anne mentioned, the website, spencertownacademy.org has um, all the resources on listing of the authors that we're presenting. And um, at the very bottom, it lists the YouTube um, link um, for watching this again or sharing it with a friend. Um, I uh, put the link, excuse me, Susan, I put the link up in the chat. Oh. Yes. It's so um, yeah, you can find it there. And if you copy that or, right. or even click on that now, you can get to that and right. have that for yourself. Thank you. Um, 
And so, and you can also see then uh, on YouTube, the interview with Peter Cease uh, with uh, Dr. Carl Atkins, and then you can watch this too. And so that they make a real nice partnership of information uh, about this. Book. Yeah, that's, that's what's up on the chat. Yep, yep. The link to the interview. Um, so thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of the day and um, see you next time. Thank Hopefully you. in person. Yes. <laughs> Come to the tent <laughs> next year. Next year. Bye. Bye-bye.